Hi, my name's uh, Maria Wheatley and I'd like to thank Ancient Origins for inviting me to speak about Stonehenge. Stonehenge is an incredible monument and we're all familiar with what it looks like today, the huddled grey stones on the windswept Salisbury Plain. But Stonehenge took a thousand years to complete. The first phase of Stonehenge was a very different monument. So imagine this, the first phase. The ancients built and constructed a ditch and a bank, known as a henge. They did this out of chalk blocks, so it was quite a sculpture almost. Imagine lots of bricks going round in a circular henge that was eventually smoothed off, inside of which were 56 blue stones. The blue stones were, some say hauled, others say that they were transported somehow, possibly using sound or other technologies. It's an open question, an open debate. The, stone, the blue stones were taken from the Preseli Mountains in Wales and constructed in this circular monument. That's the first phase. Just outside of the monument, in what's called the avenue, it's like a causeway gap in the circle, it faces the northeast, and we're all familiar with what Stonehenge is world famous for the rising of the summer solstice sun directly over the hillstone. It's world famous, and even today, 30,000 plus people descend on Stonehenge to watch this visual spectacular event. But long before that, the hillstone, where it is today, where the sun rises above it, was aligned to face the moon. And, little people, and this is a little known fact about Stonehenge. You see, the moon is a complicated thing compared to the sun. It moves up and down the sky in its year after year after year duration. So unlike the sun, which returns to exactly the same place uh, at the same time of, of the year, like the summer solstice or something, the moon doesn't. It changes. But the heel stone marked what's called its midpoint cycle. That's every nine years, basically, the moon would rise in the same place above the heel stone. And its tapering crest of the heel stone literally would point to the rising moon. So the moon and the sun was exceptionally important to Stonehenge. And we've almost forgot about its lunar qualities because we've been focused for many decades now on the sun. There's an astronomical fact about Stonehenge that's very intriguing and may explain why it's sighted where it is. Stonehenge is sighted upon a very rare astronomical latitude. An astronomical latitude represents its, its degree. It's 51 degrees north by 18 minutes, most experts agree upon. So that's where the summer solstice sun rises uh, on that line, if you will, but also at a right angle to where the, the sun, uh, the moon, sorry, in its cycle sets in the northwest. So these two points are a real angle. So it faces the summer solstice sunrise and the moon's extreme um, uh, moon set. So that's why uh, Stonehenge is where it is. In its first phase, it was well used. It was well used for about 500 years. That's generation after generation after generation. Then, sometime around 2600 BC, stage two of Stonehenge developed. And that's the Stonehenge that we're all familiar with now. For instance, the Sarsen stones, taken from the Marlborough Downs, some 17 miles to the north, over hill and uh, through dale and through swamplands, they were taken from that area and they were erected in the shape that we are very familiar with now, those huge stones with the stones on top, like a lintel. That's what we recognize Stonehenge to be. Now this phase was uh, well, uh, had a lot of activity associated with it. People would come from miles around. The interesting thing about the burial finds around Stonehenge during this phase is that we find beads from Egypt, jets from the Baltics. We must visualize Stonehenge to be a center of global importance in the ancient world, and people from all over the land came to worship at Stonehenge. So in its second phase, there's a lot of activity, global activity. People come into uh, the area. And the avenue was widened during this uh, stage. Remember I said about the phase one, there was a gap, and this uh, hero stone was placed in between that gap, if you will, and the moon would rise above it. 
Well, now the avenue was widened, quite considerably so, so that the ancients could incorporate the summer solstice sunrise. So that was the secondary feature at Stonehenge, certainly not its first. And most people don't, don't realize that it is this incredible lunar temple. So every year, the, the, the rise in summer solstice sun would rise over the tapering crest of the heel stone, but every nine years, the moon would rise in exactly the same place. Remember that astronomical uh, latitude as well, where the midsummer sun would rise at a right angle to the setting um, moon set? So all the time, the ancients wanted the sun and the moon involved at Stonehenge. And they achieved that by, like I said earlier, the widening of the avenue. Now, in a, about sort of 200 years later from this fame, the ancients decided to change the monument again. You see, they created in uh, stage two a circular feature of blue stones. They must have moved the 56 blue stones from the first phase and tinkered with the design and placed them on the inside. In the next phase, they changed the idea again. They're now creating more of a kind of oval structure within uh, Stonehenge. So all the time, they're changing the, the style of it. Were they trying to complete some kind of overall blue plan? Did a uh, uh, emphasis change, and they decided to change the blue stone features again? It used to be thought, you see, that Stonehenge had an outer circle of thirty stars, an inner blue stone circle containing around about eighty stones uh, in all, and uh, inside of which was five giant trilithons and a horseshoe shape of uh, blue stones on the inside of that and the altar stone. Now. Archaeologists don't see it as that model. They don't see the horseshoe shape of blue stones. They see an oval or possibly a, a circle. Also, during one of the phases, around about 2500 BC, a gigantic pit was dug in the center of Stonehenge. It was very long, about uh, 12 feet long, about 5 feet wide, and it went down a considerable depth. What were the ancients doing there? Again, archaeologists don't understand why the pit was dug. It could have even made some of these stone features a little bit unstable, but they wanted that pit there, and they dug it quite, uh, quite dramatically, so really going in towards uh, the earth and, uh, and the chalk bedrock. So as we can see, Stonehenge has many different flavors, many different styles, and it's interesting as well to know that all locals in the area of Stonehenge and Avery say Think with the blue stones, and the weather patterns change. It's an old, old law. And recently, in the, back in the 80s, actually, I say recently, but it must have been about 1986, when a team from Bristol University came down and they were taking samples of blue stones, somebody said that old saying, oh, but it's down hand, you know, you might change the weather. And quite ironically and synchronistically, there was the biggest gale that Britain has ever experienced the following day. And some of the local people blamed the archaeologists for thinking from the blue stones. At Stonehenge, they were master uh, astronomers. They were master geomancers. Remember I said in the second phase there was a circle of blue stones? Not the first phase, the second phase of the blue stones when they tinkered with the design. It's long been pointed out by authors such as John Michelle that this particular uh, feature of Stonehenge incorporated the diameter of the Earth. Because if we look at the diameter of that stone circle, it's 79.2 feet broad. Now you start multiplying that and, and using uh, maths as a, as a number game, uh, if you will, then 7,920. Uh, feet is the uh, mean diameter of the Earth, according to John Michel. So we can see there was a lot of things incorporated into Stonehenge, celestial movement, uh, possibly the measurement of the Earth encoded into that, and also the rise and settings of the moon. But what did it actually look like? We see Stonehenge today eroded after 4,500 years. It really didn't look like that. When we try to vision what the monument actually looked like in its pristine phase, it would have been surrounded by a chalk circle, gleaming chalk white. You would have entered down two long, narrow walls. The avenue was an earthen, uh, earthen wall of white each side, so you would have walked down an avenue of white. 
into a massive circle of white. You'd have seen standing before you beautiful silver polished coloured satin stones. So much, if you ever go to Stonehenge and it happens to be sunny or in the moonlight, really look closely at the satin. It sparkles and it's very silver. You would have walked a couple of steps further and you would have met the bluestone circle we've been discussing. Now that was so highly polished, the blue stones, that they appeared to look like the midnight sky. They were like star spangled because the blue stones are very dark and it had tiny bits of crystal feldspar, like white in it. So they would have been so highly polished, they would have really stood out. So Stonehenge was quite colourful. And the stone that bejeweled Stonehenge was the altar stone. Imagine a stone some 10 feet tall. And some people estimate it to be a little bit higher. It's hard really to know the exact sizes of these stones because sadly a trilithon fell onto the altar stone and embedded it into the ground. But much speculation on its size from 10 to 16 feet has been mooted. But more than that, it really did look a beautiful stone. It was green sandstone, flexed with garnet. So it had bits of red in it. And again, if you look at the altar stone, if you ever have private access to Stonehenge, you can just make out the red garnet against the green. So all in all, Stonehenge was a very colourful place. Now, in its second phase, which you'll see in, in part of the PowerPoint presentation, you'll see two mounds on a map. Now, archaeologists now speculate that these were enclosures. In, they were like rooms of possible timber, timber sections within Stonehenge. That's not how we're kind of used to seeing Stonehenge. Stonehenge could have incorporated certain rooms. What they were used for, we certainly don't know. But uh, we need to kind of really open our minds about the Stonehenge landscape and not see it through what we're seeing today. And that's a ruined stone circle. The lands that surrounded Stonehenge as well were very lush and very fertile. So it would have attracted a lot of uh, agriculture and a lot of people were living in the area. And we know this through a site nearby called Doherty Moors, which I've spoken about before. So all in all, Stonehenge spanned a vast amount of time. And the intriguing thing about the end date of Stonehenge, which was uh, some four or five hundred years later than the, uh, the, the phase uh, three and the phase four of Stonehenge, around about 1500 BC, it's speculated actually, the ancients decided to build two more features. They started to dig two concentric circles outside of Stonehenge. These are called the uh, Z and the Y holes. The Y and Z holes, sorry. And these were dug, but uh, presumably it was thought to hold standing stones in. But no, no stone was ever erected in them. And at that time, around about um, 1500 BC, all the building stone circle phase ended in the UK and Europe. It's like an end date, 1500 BC. What happened then? Was Britain going through weather change? That certainly is recorded in uh, wood and in also snails at the Stonehenge. They're, they're great little archaeologists. They record lots of things. They called them, uh, record uh, environments and things like that. So there was some kind of climatic change that our ancestors had to undergo at that time. And it's speculated that the stone circles were closed down there were cultural changes going on and during those times as well. People's ideas were changing and Stonehenge was then decommissioned. Nobody worshipped at Stonehenge after that date. You had almost after those dates um, tourists. The Romans used to come to Stonehenge and put deposits there. You had what's called the Iron Age Druids. Uh, they would also do deposits at Stonehenge, but Stonehenge was now quite a ruinous place after 1500 BC. Shrubs started to build up in the Henge Bank and just make it unstable. The stones possibly became unstable and with uh, wind and erosion uh, and the soil um, becoming a little bit less stable because the monument was no longer cared for could have caused uh, its downfall. Some of the stones did fall down and smash. So Stonehenge has had a long history and its history certainly hasn't ended now. Because when we look today at the monument, 
it's cordoned off. You can't visit it. You have to go through either English Heritage for private access or you walk around the monument. They have just introduced walking around the monument sunwise because before you'd go around anti-clockwise, and there was a lot of complaints saying this is partly a solar temple and you should walk around the stone circle in a clockwise motion. So English Heritage have included that. Recent archaeological studies have come up with some anomalous dates. A piece of uh, charcoal and grain was found beneath one of the blue stones of the second um, phase, or it was believed to be the second phase, and it was analyzed. And the date came back, they thought, probably around about 2500 BC. No, it was 7730 BC, which really does suggest that there is a possibility of Stonehenge being a Mesolithic monument. And a Mesolithic monument that began uh, with the blue stones, maybe the first phase was in 3000 BC, maybe that phase was 7730 BC. Do the archaeologists really understand carbon dating? I'm sure as other ancient uh, origins authors would point out, worms can disturb an awful lot of archaeology. They can drag little pieces of evidence, like charcoal, like grain, to much deeper levels. And likewise, they can take those pieces of grain and move them through the earth to much higher levels. So it's always very hard to really um, agree with radiocarbon dating. It has many flaws. So I suspect that Stonehenge is a very ancient monument. I think that it did date back to about the um, 7000 um, uh, BC. I think it was surrounded by Mesolithic buildings that were known to be erected around about that time, possibly even a bit earlier. These temple buildings uh, could have been, we're told that they're totem poles, but I think they could have been temple space surrounding Stonehenge, little is known. The archaeologists that originally dug the uh, Mesolithic post holes, that they're saying were totem poles, Hunting temple space uh, wasn't really a, a particularly good archaeological dig. Uh, evidence was missed, and it wasn't until 13 years later that another post hole was found. So we don't even understand the full history of Stonehenge. What I'd like to end with about Stonehenge is we tend to see monuments through our own eyes, what they look like today. And then we try to kind of understand that monument through archaeology and through alternative means as well. But to truly understand a monument like Stonehenge, we really need to go back to the very beginning and see it through new eyes. What did the landscape look like? What was really around Stonehenge? Were there Mesolithic buildings? What were those buildings used for? We need more archaeology and we need a more broad and open mind to truly understand the value of Stonehenge. Yeah, if anyone's interested in Stonehenge, I've got a good article on my website, which is www.theaveryexperience.co.uk. You can uh, email me, Maria Wheatley, at AOL.com if you have any questions regarding Stonehenge or I can interact with the Ancient Origins website. I also run tours to Ireland, uh, one uh, tours coming up in July, so check out the website for that, where we do have private access to Stonehenge. We're going to investigate the monument. We're going to look at it through alternative eyes as well and through the, the mysticism of the site as well. So check out the website. Go on there and have a good look around.